this is very new to me. This is literally my first Zoom presentation. And to top it off, I have to admit, I only in the last year or so learned how to make PowerPoints. So it's pretty basic and those kinds of things. And so again, I applaud all of you that have like mastered this and can do it like in your sleep and can communicate so well with your kids. Um, I applaud you, um, but also be kind to me because like I said, it is my first, but please let us know in the comments and things like that, um, what we might do to improve. We will be offering these sessions. Today we're talking set design. There's other ones. We will do costume, we'll do hair and makeup and marketing. And the last session that we'll be doing for Capital Conference will be just an overall Q&A where anybody can come in and talk about anything about it, ask any questions. So those are our five sessions that we're planning on. But because especially I'm doing more of these coming up after today, any comments and things that you guys can think of to send, by all means, you can do that either in the chat here or as I like to tell everybody in theatrical design, my email address is uiltheatricaldesign.gomez at gmail.com. I love your feedback. I love hearing things, um, especially criticisms and things that we can improve. So that being said, today we're ready to get started with theatrical design, the set part of the contest. All right, so if you're looking at the poster, you can see here, this is our contest show for this year. We are doing Man of La Mancha. Um, very, very excited about this script, especially doing it at this particular time in our history. I think it's going to speak really well to our students, and it's going to be something that they can really get their hearts and minds around, and I think that you'll really enjoy working with it. I think we've taken um, an interesting approach with it in the prompt. We're going to try to explain some of that with you guys today. Um, the prompt is available on the UAL website on the theatrical design page. If you click on there, that's where you find our prompt. It's kind of like our initial information about the contest itself. It contains the prompt itself and then specific category challenges uh, for set, costume, hair and makeup, and marketing design. So that's what you would be looking at. I wanted to take a quick second to show you something in this particular slide. As you can see, the different uh, portraits that we have of Don Quixote uh, that were included in our poster. I wanted you to see how we've credited the artists with all of this. This is going to become something that's very important in our contest this year, is learning to make sure that we're crediting the artwork when we use it for um, our inspiration pieces. So I just kind of wanted to point that out on this particular slide for you guys to see. Um, this is the official version of the script that we're going to be working with. It's a lovely little book right here. Um, the Texas Educational Paperbacks Company is on the UIL resources page. And they have, um, they have included our book as well this year. You can order it, get a discount through them. You can also, if you run across some folks, find some of the older versions. This is the libretto or the script that's been published, but I don't think they've changed it other than the cover since their initial publications of it. So if you find an older one this year, because it's not a translation issue, you can use different ones if you can't find the yellow cover. Just be aware of that as you're looking to find copies for your kiddos. Um, Next slide. I wanted you guys to understand our total goal for this contest because I think it's important. This is how I phrase it. We want to identify and define the world that the action of the play will occupy and present it in a visual form that all members of the production company may understand and work from to manifest that vision in the final production. That's our purpose. That's what we are trying to do no matter what category we're working with, but specifically with set, what we want them to be able to do is to identify and define the world that the action of the play is going to take place in and be able to communicate it effectively to those people that are going to be working with it. The people that work with their designs may include directors, may include other designers that they're working with, but also the people that will be making that particular design a reality by building or constructing or sewing, whatever the case may be. This is something for the kids to always understand and always go back to. It's a little bit different from an art contest in that we are talking about the specific use of this artistry in the theater community. So I wanna make sure that we saw that here. With this in mind, these are the things that we are asking our set design contestants to complete. We have them do a design justification paper, a prompt address statement, an inspiration collage, a scale model or scale rendering, concept sketches, and a scale ground plan. These are the things that we do in order to accomplish the purpose that we set out. We're gonna be able to use all of these things to accomplish our purpose. And um, 
This stuff is all explained. This is what the pages about set design look like in the prompt that's already on the web page. Like it's already there. You can look this up. This becomes your guideline for your students who are going to be working on the set design challenge. I think it's a good idea to print these two pages out and make sure that they have them so that they have all of this in front of them when they're working. We like to include some information here specifically about the play itself. We also have very specific instructions, including if you look in here, the sizes of things are in red. It's important to be able to see that information for them to know the requirements that they have to do in order to participate in our contest. In order to compete, they have to do all of the things that are requested of them. They cannot enter a partial entry and hope for the best. They have to do all of the different things that you can see on the screen there. And we're gonna be going over some of these things more specifically, but I kind of wanted you to see where those were resource-wise. These are the two pages that you need to see in the prompt itself. You look for them and it talks about the requirements here. All right. In order to accomplish this challenge, designers use a variety of steps we refer to as the design process. They're gonna be doing these things in order to be able to complete the challenge. They're gonna obviously be reading the script. They're gonna be analyzing the script, researching, sketching. Then they're gonna finalize their choices and then they're gonna render them. This is a process that they should be going through. It's never about just let's cut to the renderings and let's just make a pretty picture and turn it in. But it's also not about let's read it and think about it for a really long time and oops, we didn't have time at the end to communicate what we were looking at. It's a full on process and one that I like for people to allow as much time as possible with their kiddos to enact this process. It's really, really important. When you're reading the script, you're reading it one time through just for pleasure, just to enjoy it, just to get from it what you think is important about the story. And then you're going to read it again as a designer and you're going to say, okay, as the set person, what are the things that stand out in my mind specifically about that environment that I'm trying to create? When we analyze, there's a lot of great, um, I think worksheets or forms and things are out there that ask people to kind of analyze the script for all of the details that you find in a set. Probably as directors, you're pretty good at going through all of those things yourselves because you have to do it whenever you're working on one act play or anything else. You're going to be analyzing that script to figure out what's going to be necessary for the script. These kids learn and do the same thing. They're going to look in those typical places. What are the actors or the characters saying about the location? What is the playwright saying about the location? what other kinds of ideas and things come to mind from the actions themselves and coming up with their plans. They're going to be researching, especially with this prompt. We're going to be looking a lot at um, some other art applications and things like this. And this is going to let them dig into so many different places. I think they're going to have a blast doing this and just seeing how deep this story runs in our cultures worldwide. I mean, just being able to see how much this one piece of literature has been carried through in so many powerful ways to so many places. They're gonna have a, a wonderful time researching. I like to live a long time in the sketch world because that's where kids are playing and coming up with and not worried about what it looks like. They're trying to explain themselves or come up with and get their ideas initially on paper and really plan and play where they're not worried about necessarily what it looks like yet. Live a long time in those things and then have them narrow their choices and then at the end go into the rendering and making that final version look pretty and the way it needs to to explain things clearly their final choices i think all of this is um, really really important for our kids to understand as they're going through i like to divide them into these things here i say the areas that spark creativity versus the areas that display artistic skill reading the script all of these things over here is where our creativity is all over the place this is where we can open up and come up with as many different things dream big talk to directors and say, hey, I was thinking if this would be a good idea for a play. And the director can say, yeah, I really like that idea, but can I move my actors through it? So they go back and rethink. We're playing around in that particular section and super, super creative. This is the part of it that's going to be reflected later in what we're doing. We're going to be showing this because it's part of our purpose is to develop that section. And then artistically, we get into the rendering, that final product of what we're looking at. This is a particular skill that they're going to use over there. But both of these things are incredibly important in our contest and we weigh them accordingly. It's just as important that kids understand a theatrical concept and can make a play out of what they're coming up with in their work versus their artistic skill and being able to make it look really beautiful on a paper. It's a combination of this information that we're looking for ultimately and we try to make sure that our scoring those things reflect that. 
You may have a kid that's a great artist but doesn't know theater. You may have a kid who knows theater that's not a great artist yet. This contest allows them to grow and use both skills to be able to ultimately do the job of a designer. Okay, breathe. I forgot to breathe. Okay, I've been doing Zoom and I'm not breathing. All right. Um, one of the things that's kind of weird about our contest, and we talk about it, um, I've talked about it before, all designers work uh, with directors. When you're working with a, as a designer, you're not gonna just design something totally in isolation. You're working with a director and they're giving you an idea of what they want and you're giving them ideas of what you could contribute and bring to the table, but it's an ongoing conversation throughout the process. And the nature of our contest, we have a director in the prompt. The prompt is saying, this is what the director has asked us to consider or asked us to think of, and then I'm going to contribute my design to it. But normally there would be a conversation that would be ongoing. Our contest doesn't set that up specifically because of its structure, it's just the nature of it. But you as sponsors need to consider yourselves as the director. This is kind of like your character study. We're saying, okay, you're playing the director and as a director, you want what it says in that directorial prompt that we're gonna look at. You want those things, and now you can have a conversation with your students who are now the designers as if you're the director and asking what they're giving you or having that conversation about, wow, I really like the direction that you're headed with that because it, come, it goes along with what I was initially talking about, but the angle that you're going off, and I'm not sure I could use it on stage or practically, my actors might not be able to move through that. You play the director in the contest and they play the designers. And so you kind of have your own, you have to ad lib it. You have to kind of go in there and say, okay, as a director talking to a designer, people get that confused when they think about doing this contest. Like the first thing they think of is they see the work that we've had displayed at contests and they're like, oh my gosh, I could never do that. I couldn't do it. So I couldn't teach it. I couldn't get kids to come in and they know I don't know how to do all this stuff. And then they're going to jump in and do it. You don't have to be that. Your role in this contest is to be the director and ask them to do that work. I guarantee you, I can't do work the way the kids that are in this contest do it, and I'm running the contest. I could not render like these kids render, but they can do it. They are pushing themselves forward in all this. You can tell as a director if it's clear to you, if I understand what they want, if I think I could take what they're giving me to the lady who makes our costumes sometimes and she can make them, or I could take what that kiddo gave me for their set and I could take it into a shop and we could get the kids to build it, then they're doing their job. Your job is to keep pushing them towards that even if you can't do it yourself. So that being said, let's look at the design directorial prompt a little bit. Okay. The main requirements of the prompt, if you look at it, it says, this is something we always start off with. We will produce the musical Man of La Mancha by Dale Wasserman, Joe Darian, and Mitch Lee in a way that it has not been produced before. In other words, you can't copy a production that's already existence that goes without saying every year. The original story that inspired the musical Don Quixote by Miguel Cervantes is considered the first novel and one of the greatest pieces of literature of all time. It's been enjoyed in over 50 languages and has inspired artists of every medium to take a turn sharing their personal reaction, interpretation, or vision of the messages, characters, and moments from the story, yada, 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 yada. From some famous art, some obscure, they all become a visualization of the words of the universal story of Don Quixote and his quest. Man of La Mancha is described as the first true concept musical, the kind of musical in which the overarching metaphor or statement is more important than the actual narrative, in which the method of storytelling is more important than the story. Playwright Dale Wasserman calls for a definite convention of theatrical production, which you will follow, but you will look to artists who have captured their own vision of Don Quixote for visual inspiration. What this is all boiling down to tell you is the requirements that are gonna to have to be addressed in the prompt. It is telling you that we are gonna do this production the way the playwright intended it. I think it's something that makes this production very, very special is that he spent a long time, he spent a lot of time in, this, in the world of this story, and he very much wanted to be different from television. When this was first coming out, it was very different from TV. He wanted it to feel very theatrical, and he wanted to use theater to create these messages, and so he very definitely prescribed some key conventional elements, and those are what are highlighted in the screen if you look in yellow. He says that the entire play takes place within the prison. All the theatrics of the charades, as he refers to them, are created from items taken from Cervantes' belongings 
and incorporated with found items from within the prison itself. That's very specific in the script. The playwright asked for that. Now, how you accomplish that, how you choose to do that, there is theatrical magic, but we must have the impression that Cervantes is orchestrating this from within the prison. That's especially important for set design, that you know that it all stays in the prison and, and everything must be converted with what's going on on stage. The second thing that you're looking at, it says the prisoners stay on stage the entire production and become the characters in Cervantes' charades by adding items to their costumes from the trunk or found items there. So as you're starting to put things together for characters, some of those characters may be helping you to make some of the set changes that you want to see happen, but those prisoners are orchestrated by Cervantes himself. He tells them how to make the changes and to set up the moments. And so you're working with that idea in terms of how the set is going to perform during the production. It's not telling you what it has to look like. It's not giving you a style or anything that you have to go by. You have to make sure that you understand how it's going to take place within the action of the show. And I'm hoping that's clear. I'm hoping everybody understands that, but I feel like that's probably an area we may have some questions. The other thing that we prescribed as far as the, the directorial prompt this year is also highlighted in yellow. We are going to be using the artwork of others who've chosen Don Quixote as their subject. Since this book was published way back in the days of Shakespeare, people have responded to this piece of literature through art. They've created art all around it. Music's been done about it. Plays have been like adapted, things, stories, you name it. The story has been inspirational to artists of every possible medium. And it's incredible the body of work that's out there. When I first started digging into it, it just kept like overflowing from the screen, like so much beautiful work, so different so unique and so powerful in its conveyance of things about that story that I wanted to make sure that our kids had an opportunity to explore that as well. But I want them to pick one. I want them to pick a single piece of art that they use as their primary inspiration for what they're going to work from. It's their springboard. They're gonna take a single piece of art that someone else has done in response to Don Quixote and they're gonna say, I want my production to be inspired by that. And so they have to look at how inspirations are carried out into fruition. What was it that I took from that particular work of art and what did I carry over and how can I see it in my design and stuff that I created? So that's gonna be their challenge this year. And again, I'm sure there's gonna be lots of questions around those kinds of things, but please just keep referring back to this as well to think about this as our intent. As a director, you're going to be asking your students to remember these things that we have highlighted in this particular section and always be checking themselves to see, do I feel like I've answered these challenges? Do I feel like I'm doing what the director asked me to do in this instruction? I hope that makes sense. I'm sure people are typing questions away frantically. Okay, so when we talk about being inspired by art, just looking at these portraits here, I mean, you can see so many different possibilities of looks. And this was just when I Googled portraits of Don Quixote. Any kinds of things come up and there's many, 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 many more, trust me. Pinterest has got multiple lists of the best artwork of Don Quixote ever. And you will find so, so, so many beautiful pieces of work. And, and they're also different and yet they were all inspired by those same words. And I, I think it's so neat for our kids to see that. In looking at this, um, students can begin to interpret what the artist what the artist picked out of the story to identify in their artwork. Your kids are going to relate to one or the other. They're going to find one of these and say it's their favorite because I, I don't know. Like I might take for example one of these particular ones and say um, I like this one where it, they took Don Quixote's face and it's made up actually of a picture of him and Sancho Panza together on horse, but it's like everything is like combined from what you're seeing and made into something else that fills up the whole story. That might be what they start to see that inspires them. Let's look here. Here's some other art examples. Um, I love how different all of these different ones are. Um, I actually put this one down in the corner. I'm not sure, he, he hotika, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I don't want to dare to mispronounce it. I didn't have a chance to contact anybody and ask them. But what that actually is were poems that were written in Asia. These were written literally poems from Asia 
um, because people in China were reading Don Quixote back in the day, and this is their response to the anniversary later, our poems and reactions to it. But the artwork and things that are there, I mean, people from all different cultures have tackled this story and done something with it. So I feel like your kids, as they start to explore, are gonna see how beautiful um, these can be and how different. And uh, you know, they're not gonna feel like it's some weird story that they can't relate to when you start looking at these artists here. I mean, even our kiddos who love Disney, look, Disney's got Don Quixote, who knew? It's there, it's right there. And yet we can also see something that's done into like a political cartoon or something where they've interpreted it and taken a political stance with it. Um, there's so much work that's out here. Uh, obviously we've got the Picasso one. I think you can even see it in the back room there. That was the initial one that I first think of when I think of artists you know, being inspired by him. That's the one that first comes to mind. But to see all of these others and so many more, gosh, guys, your kids are gonna have a ball, I hope, researching all this and finding the opportunities. The important thing, again, to remember, though, is as they're looking at them, please make sure that they identify the artists. They can't pick a picture and say, oh, artist unknown. We want them to find the actual artist. And I think you're gonna learn how to do a reverse Google image search pretty quickly as a good way to find artists. I think it's important. I put this slide in here because I feel like, um, especially with times being the way they are right now with our country the way it is and the world the way it is a lot of conversations are going to present themselves um, when kids are reading this particular play because when you're talking about somebody fighting the foes somebody righting the wrongs in a day and time where we're reading it every day in the headlines and social media and everywhere else the script is going to bring up some conversations you're going to be having conversations with kids that the adults have a hard time having five minutes of a civil conversation with sometimes I hope that this leads to some very powerful conversations with you and your students about how art can change things and how art can move things forward and how art can present hope um, that we can overcome the things that are out there. Um, I want to make sure, you know, I, I use this slide here with, um, obviously it's a Barack Obama reference, challenging towards all of these things in the future and trying to write them. They in no way need to feel like they have to do a political piece to be successful in this contest because I feel like some kids gonna say like, oh, well, it, it must have to be political or it must have to target something like that. This play has been universally told for generations and has talked about the days and times and it has something to say about all times and all places. They should not feel like they have to be delving into something political right now because some kids may want to escape that they may have had too much of that and want to figure it out in a different way i just want you to be prepared for those discussions in a good way and to be able to turn them and allow students that space in your room to be safe and to talk about things in a positive light so i, I included that here just so that you're aware of it okay so we're going to dig into the challenge here and we're going to look specifically at what you're doing for set i wanted to hit these things definitely um, one by one so that you have questions about those answered. This is important. First off, let's look. The play Man of La Mancha will be performed on a single prison set that is transformed by Cervantes for his different charades using items from his belongings and items already on hand around them. That's important because that prison setting is going to be their primary setting that they're going to use for their rendering and their set model for later. Those options are going to be based on that prison setting. But it's talking about the charades as you go through in the different times where Don Quixote goes and like where Cervantes starts to bring out these stories of Don Quixote that they're transformed into these charades or theatrics where he is explaining his journey they're going to pick two of those. They're gonna pick two charade settings. Doesn't matter which ones they choose, they can choose either that they will use for the drawings or the concept drawings that they do later on. But for them to remember, prison setting is their primary focus. That's what we're gonna look at. And all of those changes are going to come from that original prison setting and be transformed into the charades. These are the plates that they're gonna be following. First, always is their justification paper. Students submit a maximum two-page double-spaced paper that includes the designer's production concept justification from the script for artistic choices made. It should connect the script to the inspiration board and the finished products and explain how the concept is carried throughout the design because of the choices made. We always require this paper. I want you to think back to our justification having to be an explanation of how your students addressing what the director wanted them to do. So this is where they're explaining that in their paper. 
hope that that's kind of clear with that. Um, the thing that we added last year that I think is really exciting, we added it actually because we wanted to have these on display at the state meet, um, but they became something that was really instrumental in helping to explain and narrow the, um, narrow the explanation of students to directly address the prompt. Um, and it works really well for us this year. The prompt address statement is a 100 word maximum explanation of how they address the prompt. They should also include the picture they use for inspiration. This is the example that we gave you. This is just showing like a 100 word statement and then the picture that they use for explanation. I think I used the same explanation I did a while ago. This particular picture showed uh, it used characters to make a face and it allows us to create things out of nothing or to make something look as if something else. Um, they liked that and wanted to explain that in their drawing. Please note that it does have to include the credit of the artwork. In this particular one, I credited the artist in the words of the prompt address statement. It might be that they can put it on the painting itself as a photo credit. As long as somewhere in the prompt address statement, they credit the artwork, we're good to go with that. That, that would meet that requirement. Um, the next thing that they do is an inspiration board. Students submit a 10 by 15 inspiration board showing the direction their art piece inspiration took them and the additional images that most shape their final designs. Items contained in the inspiration board should give an overall impression of what the designer wants to see reflected most in their production design. I really want you guys to concentrate on this this year. I asked our judges, um, and one of the th comments that I got was, um, it was a comment from a judge that the inspiration boards were kind of weird. It's like, they seem like a lot of times an afterthought. They seem like this thing that's just kind of a generic, beautiful picture of a lot of pretty things that are kind of like what they were talking about in their design choices and not really being used as a tool to fuel their ideas and to fuel their inspirations. It's more of a, it, it just seemed like kind of an afterthought. And what I challenge you guys to do this year is to use that inspiration board to really springboard into some ideas um, like um, other kinds of artistry that can be used. Um, so I put some extra instructions into the, um, into the prompt itself about them. These notes are there, just an example. Um, if your primary inspiration artworks included in an address statement, you don't have to show it again. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your inspo board. It could be, but some things you could include might be like, oh, well, if I like the color palette in the art piece that I used, I might look for some other materials or things that reflect that color scheme. I might look for a time period that was captured. I might do some period research for architecture or some things that might be from that particular time period and include those. If it captured a feeling, what can I use to do the same kinds of things in my set design that capture that same kind of feeling? What was it about it that I can reincorporate? Um, perhaps the artist reinterpreted or reset the hero and it inspires me to do the same. You know, a lot of people have recreated their own Don Quixotes in another setting, in another space, another time and place. Um, we've had Don Quixote in space, believe it or not, it's out there, it's a cartoon. Who knew? It's there. Um, this is another angle for you guys to consider. Maybe your inspiration came from something you found out about the artist who made the piece. Maybe the artist not only did this piece, but did a collection of pieces. Maybe they did a whole series of illustrations and you picked one particular one as your inspiration piece, but you also dug into other pieces of work and you want to include those as part of your inspiration. That's another source. That's another way. We're inspired by words. We're inspired by pictures. We're inspired by materials. This board should really reflect that. And I want you to challenge you to, to include those kinds of things this year. You're gonna use these things together to explain your vision. You're gonna use the justification paper plus the prompt adjust statement and the inspiration board. The three things together are what culminate in showing your vision of your idea of where you're headed. You don't have to include the same information in all three. They can build one off the other. Usually when the judges are looking at your work, they're going to first see your justification paper where you're talking about how you're addressing what the director initially wanted you to go into. Then they're gonna see the prompt address statement where you've narrowed that down to a specific piece of artwork and you've dug into some certain details and then you've used those as a springboard to move into your inspiration board, which they will see, where you took that idea, ran further and broader with it and came up with a lot of ideas. And then we're gonna go into your artwork and where you're starting to make those things become a reality. And I hope that makes sense to see how those build 
one after the other. I think that's important for you to see those. Okay, so then we move on to the next plate. Plate number two is an 11 by 17 plate and kiddos have the option in this case of doing either a model or a color scale rendering of their set design. And again, this is going to be, for this year, it's going to be the prison. They're going to do the prison for this plate. If you look at the picture on the left, this was one actually from this past year with Life is a Dream. It was hard for me to pull some of these. I'm trying to do it. I'm going to keep trying to do more. Um, where they showed a full picture view of the set, but then they also used some smaller detail ones of the set up close. These are actual photographs of their model that they incorporated for sending in. They only have to have one straight front picture of their model, but I encourage you guys when they work with their models, especially I think it's a good thing sometimes for beginners to work with models because once they build a model, when they can move it into the other pieces and other things that they need to, it helps them when they do their sketches to be able to have it to look like to look what it's going to look like when they're drawing it. So sometimes models are a really good way to help them to do the drawings that they have to do for the next plate. Um, as you look at these, both of them complete our purpose. I can look at this model and I could build that set. I can look at this rendering and I could build that set. That is the goal of the model or rendering. That's the goal. If it's clear, I mean, sometimes they're more clear and more artistic than others, but the whole point is when you're looking at your kids' stuff, could you look at what they're showing you and could you build it? We do not tell them what mediums they have to use. Some kids are good with color pencils, some with watercolors. Some kids might do it on SketchUp. They might actually do the full color rendering, might be a computer design that they've done. That's allowed as well. In terms of models, I've seen kids almost do a combination of them where they've created models, 3D models, out of something that they've generated from the computer and turned it into pieces that they made it into models and kind of combined all of this around. This is why we leave this particular part of what they're doing open to the way they best communicate the information. Some kids can do it flat as a drawing or from a computer. Some kids structure and build it and make it into something. It's up to the kids. There is not a preference one way or the other. There's not anybody that's going to back and say, well, if you really want to win, you got to do a No, both are fully acceptable and both have won state championships. It's not an issue of that. So it's really important for them to start to do that and to realize that. Um, and I wanted to show you some good resources. They, um, I like these because they have a lot of, I even have the live books here. Look at me. I'm in the screen and I have books. Um, they're real things. I like those. They're not just, uh, but I know I can talk about books, but there's a lot of techniques and things in these. You don't have to know how to build a model, folks, in order to get kids to do it. What you have to do is be able to give them the information, tutorials, books, things to help them, and the supplies and the materials to do it with. And most of your best designers encourage people to use trash. Take cardboard boxes, all kinds of stuff, and let them play around with them and, and make things back like they used to when they were kids, building blocks, Legos, whatever it might be to create some things and then eventually build them into those full scale, you know, versions later. This is a book that talks a lot about different rendering skills. It has even some exercises in here for doing them on computer as well. It's a good book as a resource. If you don't know how to do these things and you have money for a book, go get a book and let your kids look through this. It may help them walk, walk through it and learn. Um, but the idea is that when they're building that set, they've talked with you about it and they know it's gonna work for stage. Now they're gonna work on how to tell somebody else how to build it. Okay, colored concept drawings. This is what you're gonna see in the guide. It says they're going to have an 11 by 17 plate that includes two five by seven colored concept drawings of the designer's choice of two charade scene transformations. This is the sample that it talks about. If you look at it, it's loosely drawn. It's not necessarily fully colored, but it tells us what the stage is going to look like in a form that we can understand it. I'm not necessarily ready to build this from this yet, but I definitely get a feel for it. As a director, I'm looking at it. I can see where I can put my actors on it. As a construction person, I can kind of start to figure out maybe what pieces and things might go into it, but it's a concept drawing that's giving us the information, but not full on completed. I like to think of these as being the thing you would take to a design meeting and say, hey, this is where I'm leaning for this one scene. This is how you could turn the set around and do this with it. What are you thinking? So that they could see it and understand it. And once they okayed it, I might go in and then do the full color rendering or something else. So that's the stage of the process that we're showing in this particular requirement for the kiddos. 
Here's um, some samples. I wanted you guys to see this one. This is another one from Life is a Dream. This was their model. They have a picture of their model. These are the drawings that might come out of it as concept drawings because this change here is going to look like this in another scene and this in another scene. So you're encouraging your kids, even if they did a model, they're gonna do these drawings. Now, if I have my model to where I can move my pieces and they can turn around and then like become the next set, then my kid can look at those and draw from there. I've also seen kids that make a model, turn the model around to the right space, the way it's supposed to look like in the thing, look at it and take a picture of it and then use that to trace and make a drawing from their own work. That's allowed folks, that's a medium, that's a way of doing something. They're not doing something wrong. They're using their own work that they crafted when they made the model and they're turning it into their own drawing to show you something else with it. That's perfectly allowable. Some kids can draw, some kids can create. We're giving those opportunities because the goal, the ultimate goal is to be able to show that information clearly to the parties involved in seeing that moving forward. We always ask you to include information about the locations and what you're talking about. You're gonna look at labeling and things like that. You do need to include information like the play, um, the name of the play, the set, uh, the pages, or, I mean, the scenes that it takes place in. Um, that's what's important for set design, what scene it is and what takes place. Um, the scariest one for a lot of people of the requirements that we have is the scale ground plan because a lot of people are like going, oh my gosh, if there's anything I really, really, really can't do, it might be drafting. And I want you to understand that this is honestly, to me, the least scary thing because it's a lot simpler than it's made out to be. And I want to make sure that we prove that to you today. I want you to see for sure. Students will submit an 11 by 17 drafted scale ground plan of their set design. They're going to be using USITT standards and they're going to be showing how something's going to you know, change around. But what you need to understand is that the theater that they're designing this for, there's another place on the handbook where it talks about using the league high school stage dimensions. We give you a stage space and we tell you this is the space you're going to design for. And we tell you the dimensions and that information is there in the space. It also shows you a space of what that theater looks like if you're looking at it. You can see it's a, a proscenium space, but we created a black box almost essentially that just says, it's a box, put a set in it and make a frame around it that looks the way you want it to look. We wanted to make it super basic for drafting purposes. This, as cloudy or whatever it is, that's me. I drew that and I'm not a drafting person. And I did it with a piece of 11 by 17 copy paper, a ruler and a pencil and some information. And that's the space itself. That's all you have to show of the Wiley Theater. You're not having to do a lot of other stuff with this. Your initial information that you're getting kids to draw is that one quarter inch border around the paper, the center line down the middle, and the permanent walls of the space for dimensions. Then this title block down at the bottom, that's the information that they need to include. And from there, that's what they've worked on. That's what needs to be there for the drafting. And they're going to put their work in the center of that. This can be accomplished in a classroom. I've done it in a portable on tables that wobbled and everything else, but they can get this much of it done very well, very easily. Any kid can do it. And from there, they can move into putting their set on there the way they work it. And um, one quick hint I want to give you there is I always taught my kids when we're drafting and we're building set designs, we love the number four. Because when I'm in quarter inch scale, the number four, guess what? That's four feet is an inch. So I try to do everything in multiples of four. I use four by eight platforms. That's a one by two inch platform in scale. And I start working that way. I like to keep things mathematically simple for my kids. But guess what? When I'm building stuff too, plywood comes in four by eight sheets and so why not? So my walls, everything that I try to work with when I'm designing, I like to use in those full inch marks. So also if I have kids that like to build things first before they draft, because I know they're out there, if they're building things that are constructed in solid inch marks, if they know, hey, I know this is two inches, I know this is three inches and it fits in my space, when they go to make their scale drawing, it should fit and should work in the space. And then you know what those kids do sometimes is they put it on top of a paper and they trace it and then go back and make their drafting then they'll use their rulers and make it straight and everything the way it's supposed to, but that's how they position things and that's how they learn to put it in there. Please don't be scared of this step. Please, please, please. I want you to be encouraged by that. These are some great resources. Um, I especially love the drafting scenery book. One of the things I used to make my kids practice doing over and over and over again 
there's a lettering chapter where they learn how to do the alphabet the way it's supposed to look in drafting. And they hated me for making them draw rows and rows and rows of these little letters and things. But I can't tell you how many of their teachers thanked me that their handwriting drastically improved because they started realizing how awesome it looked when they started writing the way you're supposed to when you're doing drafting. So I think it's a great thing to help practice with, et cetera, and uh, to help them do that. Now, if you're also blessed in doing um, CAD or computer assisted drafting, you know how to do it. It's allowed to do either one. I've shown you a sample here, one that was drawn. This is kind of a combination. It was drawn, but they have a permanent title block that they've put on and they've printed that out and then used a drawing with it. That's a kind of a combination or a hybrid. I always like hybrids. This is a computer one. If you have access to these kinds of things and know how to do them, great. Again, there is no preference one way or the other with judges as to which one does better. They, I've seen both do just as well. So I think it's important to, to let, let kids dig into this and figure out what they're more comfortable doing. That's our drafting. So that's all of the requirements that they have to have done for this particular contest. Um, I wanted to quick give you a couple of kinds of materials that I like to use. These are super basic. There's better references for some of these, but this is something that'll get you started. I live for buying a ream of 11 by 17 white copy paper because I'm always making the kids do their drafting and everything on that. It's a 500 pack or whatever of 11 by 17 white paper. That's what I have them do their drafting and things on and it comes in handy for it. You can also get graph paper. This was life changing. If they're like not comfortable doing it on white paper and they wanted to have some reference, I love, I have to even show you it exists. 11 by 17 quarter inch graph paper. Amazing, works really, really well. If you're gonna buy rulers for your kids, some people like to work with scale rules. I never had money for scale rules when I was working. Um, so we just use metal rulers with cork backs on them because we could use them for cutting and things later, but they also don't slip when the kids are trying to measure things. And remember, I like to use everything in quarter inch marks. That's pretty easy for scale rules to make those conversions on those kinds of rulers. So if you can't afford the other ones, it's great. Drafting lettering guides. I. Did not ever actually work with those until this summer. I started learning how to do handwriting with them. And oh my gosh, they're amazing. It helps kids do the lettering so much easier. It's just a little piece of plastic that helps them write inside the lines and it keeps them super straight and even. Life-changing in terms of their work. Model building supplies, you can go into a lot of different things with these. Um, you're gonna wanna include some foam core, a mat board, some kinds of cutting tools like your, um, any kind of um, X-Acto knives and things like that as you see fit. Make sure you have cutting boards and things to work under those. And then adhesives, uh, whether it's hot glue gun or, or different kinds of things that you like to work with. People use different things and I feel like that's something that's pretty personal to what you're used to working with your kids. Um, the book has a lot of good suggestions for those. I also love to make one big scenic box for my classroom that all the kids can bring their stuff up and set it inside and see how it looks. I like to make one big box to scale just to keep using as that theater to try it out in. I think that's really helpful for kids. Also, um, I think it's really important for you to include a place to store stuff because when you're working with this contest, it's a lot of space. It's a lot of stuff. Having a means of storing projects between times when you're working on things. Um, those big paper boxes that you can get from the office sometimes from copy paper, giving that to a kid or a group of kids to work with the store stuff in or having a closet with some shelves in it that you can let each kid have a shelf, whatever it might be. It's important for kids to be able to store their work to continue to do it. Um, some people use a space in a dressing room in the theater, but that's something to consider. Um, rendering supplies that you're gonna to wanna to have as well. Uh, I think watercolor pencils or good color pencils are probably the most versatile for your kids to start off working with. Um, and those are just things, the ones that I think are the easiest to use. And so they seem to be pretty common. I have seen people to use crayons. It's not unusual. You can use any kind of medium that you choose to. When you're trying to up their game a little bit, I think the color pencils, Watercolor gives you the variety of kind of looking painted, but it's also a sort of pencil. This last slide I have here talks about reading the play and working with things in your classroom for the contest. Please, if you're new to this, do not try to do this whole contest in your class. Your whole class will not want to do it. Only certain kids are going to have the desire to fully do it. What I suggest that you do is maybe do the first few steps all the way down to sketching. Read a play, discuss it, analyze it, have them learn how to do concepts and things, do the fun parts of the contest. The kids that love that and seem to want to be deeper, bring them in separately, let them start taking the deep dives into the contest like the renderings and the bigger skills. Otherwise, you're going to be dragging yourself down and you're going to be tired at the end of this, I, I guarantee you. 
Um, as you start looking at the other contests, you may just want to do this one this year. Maybe you just want to do set. That's fine. One and just do one contest this first year. That's okay. If you want to allow kids to do multiple contests, you might consider having them do their first few steps all the way up through like sketching and let the kids pick which of the contests they like and do one part of a project from each from one of those contests to see if they actually like it. Do not try to make them do the whole thing unless you have advanced kids that are used to doing it and that's what they want to do. But when you're trying to use it in general classes to get the program started, you're going you're gonna to shoot yourself in the foot trying to make them all do it. Oh, you better know, um, the contest itself is digital. Each school can submit two individual student entries in each category and one group that includes four students, one of each type. That's important. That's who you can enter. You can have more kids do the work at, at school and, and try to participate, but you've got to narrow it down to your best two in each category and one group in the long run. That's important. I get a lot of questions about that. Whether students can enter more than one individual category, yes, they can. If they are in a group and also an individual, it cannot be the same work that they're using. If they design costumes individually and they become a costumer in somebody's group, they can't use their same costumes. They've got to do something completely different. Mounting instructions are included in the handbook, which you're going to get to later. The main thing to keep in mind right now is to use the sizes. Keep all of your work the right sizes. So if you do have to mount it to go to state, it's already the right size. You're not having to start from scratch and redo everything. Um, Students qualify for state by receiving an exemplary rating in round one. They're not competing against being the top two people in their district to go. Anyone who achieves that level of exemplary gets to go. And I think that's exciting for kids to compete against criteria and not just against other people. I think it's exciting for them and it gives more kids an opportunity to get to state. If they make it to state, they get to work on improvements and then mount it and bring that live work, hopefully to state. This past year, it ended up having to be online, but hopefully this coming year, we'll be back to getting to bring that work over there and they get to work on it and grow it and make it even better. It's an amazing process. Um, they also would have an oral presentation at state. Uh, the timing is in here or whatever. I think we're, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So I'm looking out here. These are my words to you. Please allow your students to do this contest. Please, even though you don't think you can do it, they can do it. They need your encouragement. They need your guidance as a director and your resources of like being able to say, hey, look over here, look over there. Do not be afraid of it. Please bring your kids to this because these kids need this. They need this outlet. They need this opportunity to shine and to, um, and to have their work be noticed. And it's just, I've seen it do so many amazing things in kids' lives. I cannot begin to tell you. Um, that was my little quote. Artists boldly inspired to dream the impossible is kind of our mantra for this year. I want them to go bold. I want them to really be excited about this year and I want you to be as well. Please, please stay in communication with us. I have my further questions and my email here to stay on the screen. And um, I think that Paula should be about ready to start opening it up maybe for some questions. Um, and so we'll try to go with that. And again, please feel free to email and give me feedback about everything that you saw today and um, questions. And I look forward to hearing from you. Paula, have we got questions? Yes, I, yes we do. Yes, we do. All right. So um, I'm going to work backwards here. So um, this, this is not a question, but a note. So when selecting adhesives, uh, like super glued, they do not work well on foam board. It's tempting because they set quickly, but they attack the foam core. So that was someone giving Right. Oh, yeah. Good advice there. Absolutely. All right. Um, question, Rachel. What is the best book for drafting letters, in your opinion? Do you recommend a book for drafting letters? For drafting letters? I love that scenery one that I had that I showed you there. Um, it's an old book. It's sometimes it's hard to find. I want to say they may also have it in drafting for the theater. I'm looking to make sure. Um, because I literally, what I would do is, I, I, I can't admit this out loud, but I used to copy the pages that had the letters and like put a set on each table for the kids to look at. Uh, yeah, the drafting for the theater book has a section on lettering as well. It gives them the steps and it really does help them to learn how to do it. But that lettering guide of keeping something easy to give them guidelines, I used to just give them college rule notebook paper and have them keep between the lines when they were writing, but those lettering guides give them a top and bottom edge to hit up against and make their, neat, their writing look really neat. Okay. Um, is there information on sight lines for the ground plan? Uh, no, there's not. Um, we, um, <laughs> that's kind of funny because we haven't really uh, ever worried about that specifically. Um, that's the first time we've had that question. That's a good one. 
um, in dealing with um, the the uh, the Wiley Theater because they could set it up any way that they wanted to. It kind of allowed them to do um, pretty much anything as far as the proscenium. We didn't worry about sight lines because we were thinking about how they could fit it onto the plate. We literally picked those dimensions because they could make it fit on an 11 by 17 plate. Um, so sight lines wise, I don't know that they get a lot of remarks about that in the critiques. I might be, somebody that's been doing this might be able to tell us more on that, but um, there's not sight lines specifically put in there. Okay. Um, can we make a black box set up on a proscenium for our design? A black box set I, onto yes. the proscenium. A black box set on, oh, so like they would use the proscenium stage, but go and move into the stage and turn it into a black box? That's what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting. Um, wow. I, I mean, I, nobody is, is off. We didn't say anything about it having to be proscenium, I don't think. Um, the Wiley space is set up that way. Um, I think that's a great question because actually the original production was done in thrust. And so I considered even like trying to figure out something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, let's play around with that and, and, and see um, as far as I'll, I'll get it, make sure that we have a, something that goes in the handbook about it for sure as a rule. Okay. But my initial thought is that's a, a great way to do it. I know I've seen theaters that have done that and done really neat things with it. I'd love to encourage it. So I'd like to say yes, but let me make sure <laughs> and put it in the one? Can a student do a design scale model illustration using non-conventional means like Minecraft? Huh. Um, I remember seeing this past year, we had somebody that did an initial model using Legos and they kind of worked in and did some stuff with that to show certain parts of things. Um, I know kids are, are uh, can do amazing things with Minecraft and I, I might possibly kind of depend on their concept and how it looked. If they keep in mind the goal of if what they finish using Minecraft to do somebody could build the set and make it look the way it's supposed to look on stage based on what they see in that format, then I would say absolutely they can do that. I, if that makes sense. If it's good, if they want it to look like Minecraft on stage, if their drawing looks like Minecraft, somebody's going to take that and they're going to build it like Minecraft. So it really kind of depends on their concept. Um, is there a place to order or buy boards that are already cut the correct size or should we cut them ourselves? We had tried to look at some possible vendors to do something along those lines, and I haven't been able to get any information from that because of COVID and everything sort of happening. Um, one thing I like to do is I order black foam core in 20 by 30 sheets because they divide into 10 by 15s pretty easily. So I can get four 10 by 15s out of a 20 by 30. Um, and then from there, like your 11 by 17s, honestly, um, I just kind of stock up on those kinds of things and have them around to, to be able to work with. And as I order them, I try to order things that I can cut and not waste a lot of board. Um, but you don't have to use that until you actually mount things for state. So uh, don't get ahead of yourself you know, too much unless you just like having the stock and having it ready. Uh, some people like to build models with them too. So they, they can use the scrap or whatever they drop out of something. They give that to their kids. They're building models to use things for. But we don't have them pre-cut for the right sizes for you yet. Okay. I have a couple of questions about the art piece. So <clears throat> can the art piece be made by another student or even themselves if they are artists? Wow. Cool question. Um, <clears throat> I had not anticipated that one. That's a good one. I, 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 honestly, I'd love to see them go bigger than that. Um, it's not, I, I want them to respond and have artistry, like if they did something themselves that was based on something. I think that's where their artistry comes in. I really still wanna have them use something that's already been created by somebody else. When you ask me about like whether another student's work, like somebody else did something and it inspired them, that's still asking them to use something outside of themselves for an inspiration and I think that's important. So um, I would say yes, they can use the artwork of another person, another student, but not use an artwork that they did themselves. Okay, um, this one is, do we need to include a standalone image of the art piece that inspired the student? Also, should it be attached to the prompt address? And should it be included in the inspiration board? On the okay, inspiration. good questions. I think the sample that we showed you of the prompt address statement, I just cut and pasted it into that when I made that one, I did a five by seven box on a Word document and I put a text box that put my hundred words in it. And then I, I just cut and paste the picture into that spot and made a little five by seven 
kind of a plate that I could very easily have taken it and cut that and mounted it on a blackboard and it was ready for state. Um, so that's where the, it's important to have the art piece positioned for sure. They can also include it if they want to in their um, inspiration board. But that's why I said that's already covered somewhere else. And so if they want to save space on their inspiration board to do something else, they are free to do that as well. Um, so standalone, I'm not sure what they mean exactly by standalone, but no, it doesn't have to be anywhere in the display. It would be in the prompt address statement is where we need to see the whole the actual piece. Okay. Um, would you go over the USITT standards for those who are not familiar? I know you put a link on there, but. Okay, let me let me tell you USITT standards. This is the down low on those. Okay, they're located everywhere. If you go online and Google USITT standards, what you need to understand about USITT is that it's um, it's a language. It's just the language of the vocabulary that is used in our industry. They'll show you what the universal symbol for a wall is, the universal symbol for a tree, or how we do measurements. It's just a way of drafts people being able to speak to one another in a common language. And so I don't want people to get too hung up on it as being like, uh, it's a guideline. It's more of a guideline than it is meant to be something that if you don't do it exactly like that, we toss your drafting aside and we don't even consider it. Um, the standards may actually be in the book that I was showing you about for the theater, drafting for the theater. I think they include them in this book somewhere, but honestly, USITT even has their own website. They can have them there as well. So um, I, I just don't want people to get so, I, I think that scared a lot of people away over the years because I get more people scared to death they're gonna violate the USITT you know, criterion and so they don't wanna do the contest. It's like, no, it's a language. It's, it's a reference for kids to look at to see what things, what the symbols look like. So I hope that helps. Okay. Um, someone asked, do you have a grading rubric that you could send us if we choose to give this assignment to our classroom students? Uh, we had a rubric that we worked with before that we had kind of formulated. We need to do a new one. Um, we worked with a ballot this past year that um, and made a few changes and some things in it. So I'd like to include that maybe in the handbook. We'll try to put that together and have something there for it. Um, that's why I really wanted in this particular presentation to focus on our purpose. Like we're always thinking of what the purpose is of each individual piece. I said those three pieces that are going to show my vision and then my drawings and things that are going to be the ones that are communicating something that has to be built. I mean, you're always looking to do those kinds of things. And so you're, you're evaluating them based on what their purpose was, but we need to come up with a, a new rubric to do that. And that's something in the works. Okay, one more question. Okay, our last question. Can you change the time or place of the production? Is it just, if it is justified and inspired by the visual arts selected? Absolutely, the, the, the time and place, with the exception that it has to be a prison. Okay, because it's very specific in the script and in um, the playwright's terms that it is a prison. But then again, prisons are defined in different ways as well. It is wide open. We want you to be able to do things. We want you to be able to dig out there and find all kinds of inspiration and art and set it in, in your, let it be a vision of your own and let you take it and be something really personal and do something really cool with it. As long as we're true to the, the script and what it really is saying and that it really works with that. Um, feel free to do that. Make sure it's in a prison. <laughs> All right, and so I made a comment for the person who was asking about buying boards in the right sizes. Most picture frame stores will cut that for you. They will. Uh, they will. Okay. Our, our teachers will sometimes help you do it too. If they have a mat cutter, they can help you to do it easier if you're worried about having your kids cut their own. Um, but again, that's usually something that we wait for until um, you advance the state and you know you have to do it later. So that's one of the reasons we didn't cover a lot of that in this particular session. All right, okay. Well, we're at time, Rachel. Thank you for a wonderful workshop. She has another one coming up on Monday, Monday. at 3 o'clock. Okay, Monday 3 o'clock is on costume design. So anything you want to say about that before we take off? Uh, no, I'm excited about that. We'll hopefully give you some ideas and some things on that because that's kind of a big part of the concept as well. Um, please, please make sure you have the email and you know that that's, what we, um, that's where we get all of our questions and things. I live to get your emails with questions. Love to answer them all the time. Or comments as well, guys. Any other comments about it, especially you guys that are veterans who've been doing this. Send me comments about things I may or may not have thought through all the way yet. That's what we tend to do at Capitol Conference is really kind of get that stuff nailed down. So please give me your feedback. All right. All right. Thanks. Guys, have a great weekend. Stay safe. Woo. See you Monday. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.